I'd like to thank you for inviting me on the show. It's such an honour to be here and I'd just like to say that when I'm not playing Xbox with my mate Thor, I really like to listen to my favourite podcast, Pop Culture Pasta. Hey Dave, I'm thinking about doing another revolution. Do you want to join up? I might need some help with organising the pamphlets though. Pop Culture Pasta So Dave, you know me. I like to ponder like most great philosophers. Like Aristotle, mm. Plato, Socrates. Absolutely. I mean, I would hold your name right up there with those in the great philosophers of, of our times. So I have been pondering life's deepest questions. Uh oh. And I think I actually came up with an answer. Oh. Or answers. And for you and I. Okay. Okay. So one of life's greatest questions is. Am I a man or am I a Muppet? Ugh. If I'm a Muppet, I'm a very manly Muppet. Am I a Muppet or am I a man? If I'm a man, that makes me a Muppet of a man. Oh, my goodness. Dude, I can belt that song. If you, I mean, I, <laughs> that is a song. Full disclosure here, I don't think I've ever admitted this out loud to anyone. I've sang the nerd out of that sound, song in my car by myself. Uh, who hasn't? Oh. Am I a man? <laughs> so I think that you're a Muppet of a man. Yeah. And I'm a very manly Muppet. Okay. Yeah, I could go with that. If you put us together, we're basically Jason Siegel. Yes. Yeah. And whatever Muppet that was. Because <laughs> that was not Kermit. And so. What, what do you mean it wasn't Kermit? Well, I'm saying it wasn't Kermit. Oh, that he's singing with? Yeah. yeah so it's, it's Walter. Yeah, Walter's not one of the A-list Muppets, Yeah, well, which makes it more meaningful. He was created for the movie, but the, the comeback. Yes. And and Kermit, you know, wasn't the same voice which as when I was a kid, so it's always a little weird for me. I'm mm. thinking, who is that? It was like watching Kermit in that Muppet. What are you? That's not even a reboot. It's, it's to bring it to a new audience, a yeah. younger audience. Um it was the same feeling I had when watching the new Indiana Jones and listening to Harrison Ford's talk. Mm, and I'm yeah. like, oh, he doesn't sound the same. This is disappointing. <laughs> it is disappointing. But yes, that song slash those deep questions, I pondered them from time to time. Yeah. And maybe you should too, dear listener. <sighs> this is Pop Culture Pastor asking you, are you a man or a woman or a Muppet? Yes. I mean, these are the, the deepest of the deep questions. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Pop Culture Pastor Podcast. We, uh, my name is Dave. Cody is here, as you heard. Yes. Clearly Thanks. just listening to the Muppets soundtrack. <laughs> well, yes. Um, so uh, this is the news segment. And, and really, I only have, there's a couple things there's a lot of things happening out well, in the world. There's a lot of things. We could have, we could have talked about Marvel a lot. Marvel, Ew. there was a lot of... Uh, okay, Ew. but you understand there were newsworthy things that happened today. Like, they just jettisoned every creative person working on Daredevil Born Again. Kick rocks. Which, frankly, from the things I'd heard, probably was a good idea. Um, go back go back to the drawing board, start over, make it look more like the Netflix one. Uh, you've got the main actor from it anyways. You might as well you know, go with what we liked. Uh, but yeah, okay, we could have talked about that. There's a couple other stories out there, but, but at some point this morning, this news story came across my eyes. And, and like, look, it's a, it's a pop culture story, but it's also a story where we get to wear our pastor hats. I don't know if I'll be wearing it long. <laughs> You're going to go right into <laughs> mental health hat. I'm just going to go right into Cody hat. <laughs> I don't even know if I can use my professions. It's just me. Cody may have some some anger. We're, we, we're working on it. We are. We're working through it. Um, so apparently this morning on today, <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but the today show, is that is that the name of it? I liked it when you said today. Yeah. The Today Show with Hoda. Hoda. How do you say her last name? Is, is the B silent? 
No, can't be silent. No, it makes a sound. I'll just we just call her Hoda. Yeah, because uh, everyone knows her as that. Uh, she's the host on the Today Show. Uh, she had on interviewing this morning Jada Pinkett Smith, which is weird to me. Why is that weird? Okay, so like, if we go back before the infamous slap, mm. yeah. Like the last time that Jada was super relevant, and I mean super relevant. Yeah. It's a different world. Yeah. You, you know what's really interesting about Will and especially Jada is Jada seems a lot more relevant right now. And I don't get it. Oh, you don't get it at all? I don't nothing get it about, at all. Nothing about the news story we're about to talk about leads you to believe that. I, I, but I don't know why people are giving oh, her you don't, the platform. You don't know why people care. Yes. Okay. Well, I can go with you on that. It is weird. Anyway, she's she's doing this interview with Hoda on the Today Show. Without and, Kathy Lee. And by the way, she's uh, she's promoting a memoir. Did I need it? Apparently, some people. Well, again, we're talking about this. Why is she? So relevant. Why is why do people want to know more about her? Honestly, the only part that I want to know more about is the Tupac era. <laughs> That's it. I'm going to keep it real. Well, I'm sure there's a chapter in her memoir about it. Well, I don't. By the way, I don't want that to escape us because I think the reason she's coming out and saying what she did today is because she's trying to sell a book that shouldn't escape us. Let's go on. I don't want to get too cynical. Here. OK, at least not right off the bat. I will get cynical for the both of us. So Jada Pinkett Smith is on the Today Show, and she starts talking about how her husband, Will Smith, and her have been separated since 2016. Will I am Smith. And they live separately from each other since 2016. And they've been putting on a public display or image that they're a unified couple since they've been married. They've been married. They got married in 1997. And yes. since 2016, that that's not how they've been living. They're technically separated. They don't live together. But they've been going on with, I don't know, another word to describe it, but a charade. Um, I'm disappointed in Wilford. Yeah. I, I guess my first question is, Cody, is why? Who does this work for? To what end? Um. Well, I'm going to... Speak and maybe project and maybe be wrong. Okay. But um, I do know within like the black community, Will Smith was held to a high standard or high regard. Like he's successful. He's created these shows. He's made this music. He's made these movies. And so actually holding up the, the family value, because we thought that we kind of had that with some other people and it didn't work out. And so if this is a strong, powerful black couple that's just ruling mm -hmm. over these here United States, great. Yeah. Um, and so maybe that is part of it. And especially considering that at one point their children um, were having... Uh, careers that were beginning to blossom and unfold within music and within acting. And then they kind of have gone the route of where Miley was. Mm -hmm. That's how I'll word it. Yeah. So, um, but honestly, it's you either go with we were trying to be a shining light, especially within this community, or somehow there's some financial gain to it. Well, I think you're right because I think it's the only possible logical ma thing that makes sense to me is that this was an image thing, that it's a public image thing. Because isn't this just like saying um, what they've chosen to do, isn't this just like saying our appearances to random people in the outside world is more important to us than, I mean, forget their own happiness. Let's just talk about the kids for a second. Because the kids know, right? The, the kids are, you know, they're aware that parents, mom and dad aren't living in the same place and clearly aren't married. Um, doesn't this say to your kids that the, what random people we don't know, strangers, think about us is more important than our kids? Because 
Like, this is crazy, Cody. This is a little nuts. And now when you look at the slap and Will being weirdly angry, Mm -hmm. because that was that was the whole confusing thing about the slap was. That's this seems odd. Where did that anger come from? Well, clearly the anger from is is, is from even when people separate, there's still feelings there. That's the nature of being in a relationship like that. Right. You, there are certain things that bond us together in relationships that especially people in married relationships uh, will take part in that literally they're, you know, you, you release chemicals in your brain and that will literally bond you to each other. And so, yeah, you're going to feel the feelings still, even though you're not quote unquote together. So you're being not cynical because cynical Cody says, ah, that was a good performance. To, to make it seem like there's a relationship there where there's strong feelings still. Because, ah, now the, the heat's off of are they together, aren't they together. It's more of like, well, why is Will so strongly opinionated on this? Chris Rock didn't say anything outlined for Chris Rock. Well, okay, but in the same interview, she also said that Chris Rock asked her out. When he heard that he'd heard through the grapevine, they were having problems that they maybe weren't together. And he asked her out and she said, no, we're still very much married. And he, of course, did what anybody would do in that situation. Felt awkward, apologized. But maybe Will Smith heard about that. And maybe, Potentially. And maybe, you know, he didn't like that so much. And maybe that would have to do. But I don't want to go there because that's not what I want to talk about. I want to keep the focus on Will and Jada. So I will say, just because we're bringing it up and I am... A man of the people. <laughs> yes. If I'm anything. And an honesty broker. Mm -hmm. um, Danny DeVito and Rhea Perlman have been doing this for years. Are they not together? They're separated. They're not divorced. They're separated. And they've been that way. Off and on since 2012. And That's wild. Consistently since like 2014, I think. 2017, my bad. So, like... It's not unheard of in Hollywood, especially considering they have been married a lot longer than Will and Jada. And so, yeah, well, let's let's move on. Because as an honesty broker, I had to throw that out because there. I do want to talk about that, that concept. And but we'll let Jada get there because I want to go th walk through this interview a little bit. Um, so she's talking to Hoda and she's saying she said, why? Why it fractured? Well, that's a lot of things. And I think by the time we got to 2016, we were just exhausted with trying. Uh, she said, I think we were both stuck in our fantasy of what we thought the other person should be. And Cody, I just found this part to be super sad, but really common. I think this happens a lot, actually. And what I want to say to people more than anything is, is if let this be a lesson. And as pastors who deal with people, you know, getting married as it's a, it's normal for a pastor pastor who's going to marry someone to do marital counseling. And so you get to kind of walk them through what all this means. Um, but if I'm, if I'm anyone listening, if I get to say any one thing about them, about what we're hearing from Jada Peek and Smith here is please people do not get married with any sort of idea of I'm going to change him or her into something else. Don't get married with that thought because that's that's not good. That's not it. You People are who they are, and that doesn't mean that you can't change. I mean, we talk about sanctification in, in church circles. Um, you can change, but people are, will always have the scars they have. And by and large, I think, you know, people act the way they act because of those scars. Yeah, and... I don't know if they've gone through couples counseling or anything or if they have their own individual therapist, but um, some things need to be processed, I think, outside of, of a marriage, especially when it comes with individual baggage that you might have been bringing to the marriage, and then it can be processed with that other person. Um, but... Being Hollywood types, um, that creates its own baggage. And so I don't know if 
necessarily they were bringing stuff to their marriage or if stuff got tossed in because ah, you're around all these people, you're around all this wealth, you have more access to these things, stuff happens. Yeah. Yeah, well, and and here's the thing is is you said uh you said something in there too. It's like when well when you're dating, we focus on all the wrong things, right? Uh when we're dating because uh, mostly culture, the world says the dating is the place where you figure out if physically you connect, right? Like if you could just live with someone because you are physically obsessed with them. That is not a good standard. No. And we talk about like passion and things like that. And, and, and mostly that's, that's silly because look, Will Smith doesn't look like 25 year old Will Smith anymore. Jada, Jada Pinkett does not look like 25 year old Jada Pinkett anymore. Now, granted, they're still in pretty good shape. I was going to say they look they, reasonably good for their age. They look better than 34 year old Cody, <laughs> but they won't forever. And that's my point is you can't base a relationship that's supposed to be the last you your entire life on physical things because you're going to change. You're going to grow old. And if you base it on that, then there's going to be a problem, which is why dating is supposed to be about, Hey, I'm going to get to know you. I'm going to get to know your brokenness and I'm going to, I'm going to get to a place to decide whether that's something I want to take on and, and bind my life to yours. Right. My wife had to sincerely look at the broken shell that is me and all my brokenness and decide somehow implausibly that she wanted to be with my brokenness for the rest of my life. That's what dating is supposed to be about. Now, I'm I'm not here to tell you that my wife and I did it right because I wasn't even a Christian back then, and Spoilers. I didn't look at it. I didn't look at it the right way either, and we struggled with that, as mm. many people struggle with that. But love is not something you fall into; it's something you choose to do. I was just reading a study that the person you will spend the most time with in your life—it was like it measured. It did. A, it was a study on who you spend time with, right, in your entire life. And there was these graphs and everything. And uh, like, so it even said it mapped out your kids. So like the time you spend with your kids, like just steeply goes down after, after they hit 20. It does until they take care of you yeah. or they put you in a nursing home and then you never see them again. Yeah. Your friends steeply down after your 20, your, your, your acquaintances, even like the only one that went up over time with time spent with them, like they actually measured it in minutes was your spouse. Oh, I would have guessed work compadres work, work relationships until like were retirement. pretty steady and they just went marginally down as your work life went on because you know, you get better jobs where you get your own office. <laughs> That's what it's all about kids. Yeah. <laughs> but the only one that goes up in minutes over the course of your life is your spouse. And, and what am I saying? What I'm, what I'm saying is you're going to spend a lot of time with this person. So you should put a lot of thought into the idea of, Oh, do I want to marry this person? And it shouldn't be again, the things that the culture often makes us think dating is about like, well, I got to marry a good kisser. <laughs> like, yeah. Ah, that better not be at the top of your list. <laughs> so I will say Dave took a very pastor friendly route. Mm. So my route is completely different. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you want to move on? Because I there's more from Jada Pinkett. Okay. We'll go to Jada. And if it correlates yeah. with where I'm at, yep. great. If not, okay. we'll circle back around at the end. Yeah. L l listen, that was the end of my pastoral stuff. Because now we're going to get into the part where I'm cynical about what she's saying. I don't believe her. Okay. Uh-oh. Dave's calling shenanigans. At one point. She, in the interview, said she considered a legal divorce, but couldn't go through with it. Quote, I made a promise that there will never be a reason for us to get a divorce. We will work through whatever, she said. I just haven't been able to break that promise. Now, Cody, this is this is straight up junk. Um, like the second half of the promise that there won't ever be a reason that we won't be able to work through it. Like, you're not working through it. Yeah, you're literally not married. Yeah. You may be legally, but you're not married. 
So, yes, we're, we're getting close to where Pastor Cody comes in, <laughs> but it's not geared towards Will and Jada. It's geared <laughs> towards people. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there, too. Um, in what she's saying here, this is totally ridiculous because you're not being married. You literally live apart from each other. You're only married in legal definition form, which like, and to be clear, to be honest, this is where people have the most problems, by the way. We have a hard time separating and distinguishing between marriage as it pertains to the law and the government and, and marriage as it pertains to covenant and love. Yes. So the, the big thing that no pastor ever says that I will say is I wish that like government licensed marriages weren't done by churches. Yeah. Make it a justice of the peace that right. is a judge or somebody. I know why we do it this way because there's a lot more pastors. So that makes the courthouses less busy and you can do a lot more civic things. But at the same time, it's like, ah, this doesn't necessarily align with what the traditional church wedding was about. Well, it's not good for churches. For people in that environment and it's not good for the people to do it because like look like what you said there are people that get married in churches with a wedding ceremony that aren't believers in that at all they're thinking this is for the eyes of the government i'm going to be married i'm going to be mr mrs so-and-so and we got married in a pretty building and we got married in a pretty building which is fine and that's great but here's here's something else those ceremonies have they have these things called vows that they do uh, but you, Jada didn't keep them. Will didn't keep them. Like, listen, you promised the other person that you would be there in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, in for rich or for poor. If in their case, richer or much richer. Um, the Indeed. point, the point of those vows, those specific vows that you go through, are to say, "I'm not going to quit on us, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad I feel." Because that's what love is. Love is not always, um, you know, riding off into the sunset together. It's hard. It's effort. It's it's something you effort. And and I think most people are like, look, you might be out there saying, well, not my marriage, Dave. My marriage is easy and it's great and it's fun and it's wonderful. And you're like, look, that's awesome. I'm not saying it can't happen that way. Uh, but I am saying for most people. Men and women are wildly different. You have different values. You have different things you like. And, and it's hard. It's work. You have, to, you have to put that together and you have to say, hey, just because we had an argument, that doesn't mean I got to leave now. Again, Dave being the super nice pastor. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's, let's bring it back to Jade and Will. Like, no, you separated. You haven't kept your vows. You're not living together. So you're not really married. You didn't legally end it. And you want us to look at that. And, and, and I get the feeling she's trying to, like, she wants us to say that's noble. Nah, son. No. Nah. Mm. No. Let me tell you why it's not noble. Because you're separated. You're, you're going to talk about it publicly. Because you have a memoir coming out. And, like, look, it's hard to not cynically look at this and think, this is... All of this is about their image. But what's being forgotten? What's being forgotten, Cody? What? I don't know. As a child of divorce, let me tell you. All I can think about is their kids. So I'm reading this article, and all I can think about is their kids. And lo and behold, what happens to come across my field of vision after I'm done reading this article about her, her, her marriage? I don't know what would come across. This is crazy. This was this article was actually released. Now, I'm just going to tell you it's National Enquirer. I trust them Someone's, with some things. <laughs> like, look, they are what they are, but they're not always wrong. This is true. And they did, like, the, the crazy thing is this story is released less than 24 hours before her interview, which blindsided everyone. No one knew she was going to come out and talk about this. Okay? Um. So the National Enquirer, they've scooped stories before, and this came out before her interview, and here is the story. Here, here, here's the headline. I'll give you the headline first, right? You ready for this headline? 
Willow and Jaden, those are the children of Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith. Mm -hmm. Willow and Jaden are both extremely fragile right now and clearly traumatized by their parents' behavior to the point where they're acting out. That is the headline. Singer Willow, 22, recently shocked fans when she posted an image of a cartoon character lying in a hospital bed with an IV drip, writing, every time I act nonchalant, my condition worsens. On the previous day, she shared, you either quit or keep going. They both hurt. So Willow, this is according to whatever source the story has. Willow's humiliated by the public way her parents have destroyed their marriage and each other. The insider alleges. And she's crying out for attention because fear for her well-being. A week later, Jaden, who's 25 years old, who admits to using psychedelic drugs, raised a red flag when he posted a photo of himself with paramedics in the background carrying medical bags. And I want to say, yeah, yeah, they're hurting. Yep, and they have been. Because unlike the public, who's been blissfully unaware because you put out an image of yourself that says, hey, we're happily married and we're a strong family union unit, the kids now get the worst of it. Because one, they're well aware of what the real situation is. And they're well aware that it's more important to you, the parent, to fool people out there. It's more important that your image is protected rather than the kids. So, Cody, take it away. Okay, so I was going to layeth the smacketh down on both Will and Jada coming into this program. Layeth it down. Okay. So you brought up in our text before the the show like come at it from a pastoral point of view pastor cody was in a cynical state (laughs) (laughs) so it's really hard not to be yes um there's a cool story in the bible that like no one really ever talks about (laughs) um and it's ananias and sapphira Mm -hmm. and it's i'm pretty sure it's in the book of acts anyway so what they did was they sold their property And they said, we give all of the proceeds from this cell to the church. Spoiler alert, they kept a little bit back for themselves. Okay, yeah. Um, Which probably would not have been a bad thing if they had not said, hey, we give all the monies to the church. Mm, They let their right hand see what their left hand was doing. Indeed. Um, And Peter asked them, are you sure? (laughs) <laughs> you sure? <laughs> and um, they they had uh, they were talking to Ananias, and and he he asked that question, and then Ananias just after saying yes, I'm sure, gave you all the money. He fell over dead, mm. and then oh no, like Sapphira comes in. They ask her the same question. She's like, Yeah, why do you keep asking? And he's like, oh, you hear that sound? That's the men that are carrying your dead husband out, and they're coming for you next. And then she falls over dead. No way. Yes. And the moral of this story, because you might focus on, like, oh, this God's very strict and punishing. I, I, that's not the point. And God isn't sending that. The point is, like, when your public image and your like selfishness outweighs the betterment of people and you proclaim that you are something and you are not that something you then have ruined your whole witness. And the thing is with Will and Jada, they both project as teachers, as wise people. Will was doing this like video series of, Oh, wisdom with Will, something like that. And then Jada had her Red Table Talk show. Guess when that Red Table Talk show started, Dave? 2016. No, 2018. Oh, okay. So they had been separated for two years. But both of them projected, hey, we are strong. Even when our relationship seems weak, we are still together. No, you weren't. Yeah, they lied. It's all lies. You were lying to me. Not all of you should become teachers, and we shouldn't uplift people as the moral standard. Um, Now, the one good thing, and I mean the one good thing, and it might not be good because it was cynical Cody at this point, that comes out of this is when Will smacks Chris Rock, we get 
Sean, my least favorite pin, <laughs> like talking about I'm going to melt down my my statues and give uh, them to uh, make bullets and give them to Ukraine. Yeah, quit with your virtue signaling. Yeah. Like, because he said that was like the most horrific thing he's ever seen. You literally interviewed El Chapo. Uh, literally. And also, I, I think Madonna might have some words to say about that yes. as well. Considering that she alleged that Sean was violent in mm-hmm. their marriage. And not the only one who has done so. Yeah. So but, enough. This is not pontificate yes. too hard there, Sean Penn. Yes. So for me, it is the be careful of like seeking fame and seeking your own glory. And because especially when your own glory is a lie. And because they here recently, the reason why Jada is super relevant is because she has this talk show that empowers people. But guess what? If a chunk of it's based on a lie, you're no better than that person that lied about what they did and got the Oprah's seal of approval on Oprah's Book of the Month Club. Yeah. I don't remember that guy's name. Don't care to. And I don't care if they are famous anymore, honestly. Like, there's not anything that they have brought to the culture, like within pop culture, that I'm like, ah, you need to stay here and be prominent figures. Now, I'm not calling for them to be canceled either. No. I'm just saying that, like, if they went away, I wouldn't think twice about it. I'd be like, hey, Will had a great music career and film career. And that would be it. Yep. And then I would occasionally think about Jada when I'm watching reruns of a different <laughs> world. Dude, so mildly acceptable Jada Pinkett slander. Um, listen, yeah, th- I think that's the thing too. It's like we're like we're we're usually not this serious, but this this story just popped off today, and it was so. I think every once in a while, the culture is so strong. Man, the world, the culture is so strong telling people, telling us all these lies of that this should be chased and this should be chased and this passion should be chased and you should go after this and go after this. And every once in a while, you get a real story that slaps you in the face and says, oh, by the way, that was those were all lies. Yes. And even when it looks like it's something that should be good on face value, like marriage. Yeah. And yet... Like when it is perverted or misconstrued and isn't what it actually is supposed to be like, oh, it looks very broken. It looks awful. And I don't know why you would stay together yeah. as just any version of me. Go ahead, get the divorce like you, you, you don't have anything here unless you are trying to work through this with like counseling, therapy, something. But being separated and doing a book tour does not count as working through this. Yeah. And I think my, the point of all this isn't for us to condemn them. Nope. Like, like Cody said, no, like, no, you know what, you know, what's true after this, I'll still go see a Will Smith movie. Oh yeah. I would still go see that. I, I don't condemn them for this, but I would say to you, to the people listening to the people who watch them, to the people who, who may have held them up, in your mind before is don't do that. Don't do that for an image. Cause you don't really know people like, look for uh, Hollywood couples, for sure. You don't know them, but there are people in your own church, your own work, your own, you know, friend group that you don't really know. You oh don't, yeah. You don't know what's going on in their lives, uh, in their relationships. And it's dangerous, especially with social media for us to look at, somebody's image that they're that they're curating and that's what social media has done is we're all curating an image that's that's a fact uh don't put much stock into those images because like look they're just not they're not real they're not true everybody's struggling everybody has problems and man i just can't stop thinking about the kids because like yeah of course willow's hurting of course she's hurting of course Jaden's hurting it makes all the sense in the world that they would feel humiliated humiliated and or like you don't know what life was like when they were in the same house. Yeah. Yeah. And like that could have been a train wreck that ah, needs years of processing all on its own. So, well, as, and as a pastor, let me also say 
you shouldn't stay you shouldn't stay together just for staying together sake if y'all are dangerous for each other and i don't mean just in a physical sense although yes if if someone's dangerous to you in a physical way don't stay there get out um but like i mean just dangerous to each other's you know well-being your kids like your kids are going to benefit in the long run by having peaceful content happy parents um and i've been in a household you know before where things weren't happy things were toxic and that's not good for anybody in the house so to be nice pastor cody for once Mm -hmm. um if i move a mountain and don't have love Mm. it means nothing yeah and so staying together for togetherness sake without love it's useless it's meaningless it's smoke it's vapor it's mist get rid of it yeah as reverend al says let's stay together I don't know all the words. Whether times are good or bad, happy or sad. Happy or sad. Yeah. I know the words. That's the way, you know, the vowels come back in. Um, yeah. There was a little John Cena, Dwayne The Rock Johnson news that I thought was just a breath of fresh air, so I'm going to share it. You can't see Cena. <laughs> Is it Cena? I'll say Cena. Um, John Cena said this in an interview. He said, if you've been following what I've tried to do, especially as of late, publicly and, publicly and personally to Dwayne Johnson, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, I've stated that although I thought I was trying to do what's best for business, Cena said about starting a feud, I went about it the wrong way. I violated his trust and I made allegations about his perspective that I knew nothing about. And deep down, I was a fan. I wanted The Rock back in WWE. I wanted to do anything to get The Rock back, but I did it the wrong way. Now, Cody, explain for those of us who weren't into wrestling at this time what he's talking about. So my dear friend, Dwayne, Mm -hmm. basically my twin. Yes. um, He got big and famous post scorpion king um and so as he is going into the movies more and more his actual appearances at raw and smackdown and other wwe events goes down so my dear friend jonathan cena decided he was going to do a uh vignette or a promo about uh calling out the rock saying you're just mr hollywood now you've left us behind and like you gotta remember where you came from trying to tease the rock to come back in now this happened many moons ago Mm -hmm. and i mean many moons ago yeah that by on its own by and large not a huge problem because there's a lot of what we call kayfabe in wrestling where there's a lot of play acting that has some real intentions behind it but why does it become a problem it becomes a problem primarily because my friend jonathan cena is now mr hollywood jr Mm, yeah he did the same thing and literally (laughs) they're in the same franchise the fast and furious franchise and they were both dc people for a bit yeah Dwayne a lesser bit because john cena's still going uh, cause peacemaker season two is happening. Yeah. So yes, he missed the, the, the point of, ah, you got to do what's best for you. And also your body's not going to be able to handle wrestling forever. Um, yeah. if you've seen or watched any of the undertakers, like last two years of matches, they're rough. They're rough. Especially if you grew up watching the undertaker twenty. 20- Five thirty 30 years ago mm. it's rough he said he went on to say i didn't do it the respectful way so i had to eat a little bit of crow i had to say i'm sorry and i was wrong because i am sorry and i was wrong and that's a very humbling experience Dwayne is a heck of a guy i became who i despised i see that perspective and i understand it it was a great learning experience for my mistake with feuding uh with the rock and all i really wanted to say by bringing that up is he didn't have to say any of that. It's not like this This was in the news. It's not like he was exposed in any way. He just offered it up, and I dig that. I dig the humility there, and it makes me think, hey, you know what? John Cena is probably a pretty good dude. Um, well, he does have the record for most um, um, the Make-A-Wish uh, Foundation wishes granted. John Cena does. Does he really? That's yes. amazing. 
So I last I had heard he was well over six hundred wishes granted. I'm pretty sure. Um, and he was ahead of whoever was in second place by a significant amount. Yeah. So John can be a really nice guy, especially to to people that need the love and support. And Dwayne and John both recently uh, came back to WWE uh, on SmackDown in Denver like a month or two ago and uh, have been here and there in WWE since. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. All I really want to say about that is a b- normalize talking about when you were wrong, normalize taking responsibility for it and normalize apologizing to the people that you, you made feel a certain way. Be more like John Cena and apologize to the rock. All you jabronis, <laughs> not for black Adam though. Cause that was, <laughs> that was not good. Um, Hey, we're moving on with the show. We're going to go talk about our main thing with our guy, Scotty. But in order to do that, you know what time it is, Cody. I do. The Geek Phone! The Geek Phone, brought to you by Insert Sponsor. You are listening to Pop Culture Pastor. Okay. Well, we're not on the Geek Phone. Uh, the geek phone not sponsored yet and so (laughs) clearly (laughs) it has a few shorts in it a bug if you will uh someone else is on the line a few houses down i don't know because evidently that was a thing (laughs) we're on a party line yes our neighbor's using the phone right phone line right now we can't get on um yeah we're having all sorts of technical difficulties like i'm not really sure what's happening but stuff ain't working Mm, heartbreak yeah it is so cody and i will attempt to just talk about what we were going to talk about it might not take as much time we were going to do comics conclave with scotty and we're going to let's we're going to talk with scotty about uh our main subject which is was going to be our favorite movie theater experiences and slash memories okay can i start us off yeah yeah do Uh, do we want to like summarize what we're talking about though before we get there okay because i want to get something out of the way okay we need clarification um I actually, I, you've heard me on this program say multiple times, save the movie theater. Mm-hmm. I actually hate movie theaters. Really? <laughs> um, so, like, there's multiple reasons why. Most of the time, like, movies really don't need to be viewed on that big of a screen with that sound system mm-hmm. and for that price. Like, yeah. I can do it at my house. Now, Chris Nolan movies, those need to be watched in IMAX. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I'm justified in going out and seeing that. And I've also had some bad experiences at the movie theaters where, like, Star Wars uh, Episode 8. I go to Tulsa's uh, B&B Theater to watch this uh, movie actually it was an AMC go to their theater to watch this movie and I'm going it's like 11 o'clock in the morning it's early and there's already a showing that is just getting out right as we're about to go in and these people they see me like trying to walk away trying to plug my ears because I don't want to hear it and then they're talking obnoxiously loud. Spoilers. Ugh. Spoilers. No. And I'm like, you are the reason Star Wars fans have a bad <laughs> name and kick rocks, jabronis. <laughs> um, so, yes, I do have some some angst with movie theaters and movie experiences sometimes. Now, I will say I do see the purpose. I see the jobs. I do get that there are fun experiences that happen at movie theaters. I've had some great ones. We'll talk about them. Um, But just know it's a mixed bag for me. Not every experience at the movie theater is good. I've also been there when, like, it quits working halfway through. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Not fun. Were you ever in there when they when the film? So back when they still use film, and the film projector would burn up the film. Oh yeah. And then you're just done. Like mm-hmm. they don't have another copy. 
That's just you're just it. That's it. They, they refund you your money, and it didn't matter if you were like halfway through the movie. They're like, sorry, I've had that happen a couple times. That's interesting. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, I get it. Uh, not every movie theater experience. I just and again, if you spoil a movie, you oh. are low, low scoundrels. Yeah, there's people like that. Usually, I find middle schoolers can be like that. You'll go into theater and you're watching a movie and there'll be that group of middle school kids in there and they're talking loudly. Like clearly they this is not their first viewing of the movie and they don't care if you're they're bothering your enjoyment. Yeah. It's, Look at you, Ayla. It's, <laughs> it's uh, easier to think under- your daughter does that. No. Uh, my daughter loves the movie theater experience. So she would never like honestly, in a lot of ways, the movie theaters like our church. In Terrasante. Yeah. You, this is this is a place of honor and respect, and you should have honor and respect for the other people in there watching the movie. For me, growing up, it absolutely was my church, and I say that non-jokingly. And I can say that, like, there's some people that really despise the church, even though they know they should like it. They have a mixed relationship yeah. with it. Mm-hmm. I do with that. Yeah. So, uh, but I agree on principle. That not everything that comes out in movie theaters needs to be seen on the big screen. I saw Oppenheimer in IMAX with my wife, which was amazing. I mean, you could make out a pimple on Florence Pugh's back, among other things. And <laughs> yeah, but she doesn't have a pimple on her back because, you know, they airbrush that out. Spoilers. Yeah, they don't, you know, you, you wouldn't see that. But anyways, <laughs> like, it, there are movies where, oh, yeah, you definitely want to go see that in that experience for sure. Um, the Book of Eli. Oh, The Book of Eli was a great movie. I love that movie. Um, but yeah, uh, not every experience is great. Uh, usually, my bad experiences have to do with other people. People be jabroni sometimes. Yeah, and like, look, this is I'm about to say something, and know that this is someone who has four kids. So I've been there. I've been there where you don't get to go to the movies for a couple years <laughs> because you have a kid. Uh, but don't bring your baby to the movies. Don't bring your baby to the movies. If you're watching like a R-rated movie that, oh, especially man. if it's a slasher, don't bring your little kids. Don't bring yeah, seen that too. Your 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 middle school kid. I'm okay if you bring your high school kid, but like you are creating job security for <laughs> mental health professionals and school counselors that they don't need or want. And you're a throwback because that's kind of how we lived in the eighties. We were watching all sorts of things. We probably shouldn't have watched as just saw things too young. Like I've seen things, Cody. And then as someone that works in schools, you hear kids talk about this and then you hear some kids talk about like, Oh, I can't sleep at night. And like Maslow's hierarchy of needs is completely shattered. It is awful. Stop it. Oh, just Mas- stop it. Oh, Maslow. Yeah. Coming up with those needs. Yeah. I think Dennis Leary said, or George Carlin said it best when he said, drop some of your needs. <laughs> <laughs> George might not have been the most sensitive of dudes. He wasn't. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to, I, I, I was talking about this with the other day with someone and so it just kind of sparked in my head that like, oh, we should talk about some of our favorite memories in a movie theater because I have lots of good memories in the theater and not all of them were movies that needed to be watched on the big screen or in the music because, for instance, I remember comedies like I remember going to see something about Mary. I remember seeing old school and I remember those times going with friends where I laughed so hard I couldn't breathe at times or I started crying because I was laughing so hard. And I remember those fondly. Um, but that's kind of what I'm talking about. These times, there are movies we see in the theater that we just remember. And I wanted to try and recall all of the stories that I could possibly recall. And so, and I asked you to do the same. And we asked Scotty to do it, but you're not going to get to hear Scotty because the geek phone's malfunctioning. Darn party lines. <laughs> um, so, Cody, you know, do you want me to lead off? Do you want to lead off? I can lead off. Okay. Uh, so I'll start off with my first memory. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in the community that we record in, and um, the movie theater was across the street from where the movie theater is now. All right. Back then. Uh, now it's currently a parking lot. 
Um, it is. And so my family, we never went to the movie theater when I was growing up. And I mean never. I don't think I went to the movie theaters again with the exception of like we, there was a drive-in movie theater within like 30 minutes of us that we that I went to in middle school. I didn't go until like I was a freshman in high school. So they were doing a re-showing of the Apple Dumpling Gang. <laughs> so I don't even know what that is. It's a Don Knotts movie. Wow. And um like an old Disney thing? Uh Tim Conway. Tim Conway, yeah. Dwarf? Dwarf on golf? And so, yes, I mean this is yeah, they were doing a reshowing of this like twenty years later or twenty five years, I don't know. Yeah. And my parents were like, Oh, this is good, wholesome TV. My mom like grew up with like the the cheesiest like worst shows ever and so <laughs> yes we watched that and ah, it was fun but like i just remembered the popcorn that was like my first introduction to movie theater popping corn as the kids say and so yeah it was fun yeah yeah um my i'll, I'll echo that and talk about my first movie theater experiences um my first movie theater experience that i can remember my mother took me to see return of the jedi 1983 so i was seven years old hey and obviously that is i mean just ingrained in my mind i remember writing uh writing hiding behind the seat when the ranker monster scene so you you went to see like a classic for a first movie yeah an all-timer and yeah, and, and, and that's nice. It's interesting because uh, that was my mom and I didn't get to go to as many as many movies in, when I was very young. It was actually my dad that took me to a few movies because I remember the first movie my dad took me to see was Ghostbusters. And again, I hid behind the seat in front of me for the the beginning scene with the ghost librarian. Um, but I remember loving it. I loved Return of the Jedi and I loved Ghostbusters. And then th that was in 1984. And then in 1985, I remember him taking me to two movies in particular, which we've talked about many times here, I think, on the pod, Goonies and Rocky Four. So Dave was just out there living his best life, watching oh, all the great movies. I was. I was, <laughs> you know, and it is it any... Is it any accident that the four movies I just mentioned are just some of my favorites? They're they're my favorite movies. And I think that's because of the movie theater experience. Although, you know, back then it was a little bit different. Uh, it the technology, was a lot cheaper. Yeah, you know, it was. Technology wasn't quite the same. Floors were still pretty sticky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the floor was always sticky. You didn't want to touch the floor. Uh, it was pretty gross. But, um, yeah, I... Those were the first movies I remember seeing. Now, it, 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 I don't have a particular order I'm going to go through as far as chronologically. Oh, yeah. Here on out, I don't have yeah. a chronological order. It is just if it was a quality experience and why it was a quality experience, which will be more quality because literally I was like four or five when yeah. I yeah. watched my first one, and it was like a one-off. So I am going to stick with the family theme because I used to um, – I don't know if I've ever really talked about this on the pod, but one of my favorite people just ever was my grandma. Uh, my grandma, her name was Margaret, and uh, she used to take me to movies. We'd go out on dates, essentially, uh, my grandma and I, and we'd go eat dinner, and then we'd go to a movie – and I absolutely adored these times uh, with my grandma. One time, we went to go see Jurassic Park. Hey, that's one of my all-time favorite movies. Yeah, which, you know, if you're just talking about the movie and the movie theater experience, I, I don't know if it gets better than the movie theater experience of seeing Jurassic Park. Because that was the first movie I really remember seeing in a theater where the sound mattered, the way it shook you. When when the diamond, especially in the the T Rex scenes, so that one would be a good one if they re released it for four D. Oh yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. I would love them to just re release the movie in general, so I could go see it in a in a better, more technologically advanced theater because it was cool enough 
even back then. And then, of course, there was the bigger than life aspect of it all. Uh, it's one of those movies that was is absolutely a movie theater I'll never experience, I'll never forget. And more so because of something that happened during the movie. So this is a full theater. We get we got there. I mean, almost right at movie time. So we didn't get the seats we'd normally like to get. My grandma and I, we had to sit, um, you know, near the front. Ew, gross. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it wasn't perfect, Um, but we're watching the movie. We're enjoying it. And, you know, the scene at the end where the T-Rex saves them from the velociraptors. I know all the scenes. And it lets out the giant roar as the banner when dinosaurs rule the earth drops. And it's just this. I mean, it's one of the most incredibly framed scenes, I think, in all cinema history that's why stevie spielberg is world renowned right when that happened and the t-rex busts through and all that's happening my grandmother stands up in the middle of the theater and and i'm and and i'm she's british so i'm gonna do her voice so don't let this weird you out she's like oh oh i have a charlie horse i have a charlie horse and she's like <laughs> literally standing up like rubbing her leg and yelling because she had like a charlie horse is a cramp for the uninitiated yes. in her leg and the excitement caused her leg to cramp up. And she's like, Oh, Oh, I have a Charlie horse. And I'm just like sinking into my chair. Cause I'm in high school. And this is like the most embarrassing thing ever. Uh, but now of course, now that I'm not in high school, I'm worried about my rep. I just remember it as this wonderful endearing memory of a woman that uh, I just genuinely loved more than just about anyone else on the planet. And uh, I miss her. And that was just this great memory. And I just will never, ever forget that moment. And we laughed about that for years after that, of course. Uh, but that's I'll never think of Jurassic Park without thinking about my grandma. Mm. Yeah. That's a good story. I like it. Yeah. Uh, mine's, wholesome, not, huh? mine's not going to be wholesome. <laughs> um, although I will say. Was someone making out during Schindler's List? No. no. And I did not watch that one in theaters. <laughs> Again, I was sheltered. Um, but I will say my last one um, will be a wholesome, like, aw, sweet moment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but this one is uh, The Dark Knight. Mm. Um, again, you go watch Christopher Nolan movies in theaters, and then, like, because you live in a small town, you don't have IMAX, you watch it opening night on the not so great screen and then you go somewhere else and watch it on IMAX. But anyway, so back in the day they used to do midnight premieres. Mm, yeah. Mm. And I'm going to talk about one later. So I went to this midnight premiere with one of my friends who um we worked together uh for this psychosocial rehab group, PRG as it's referred to in mental health terms. Uh, in the local area, it's known as Sika. And so he's like, dude, you got to watch this movie. It's coming out at midnight. And I'm like, could we not go like tomorrow at like seven? <laughs> no, you got to go now. And this is before like it's easy to spoil something for people because Facebook's not super huge in rural Kansas yet. MySpace is still a thing. Mm. That's about it. Big ups to MySpace. But rip. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, so we go to the theater and it's three quarters full, which is like a full screening most time for for our cinema because they never get full. Yeah, it's a packed house. Yep. And um uh, my one of my friends, Cody Nichols, who you oh, know, Cody Nichols, he's there. Yeah. His his family's there, and so like he's sitting in front of us. His family sitting in front of us, and uh, gets into the action movie. It's going good, and then there's the the Joker's. Do you want to see magic trick scene? And everyone, and I mean everyone in the movie theater had an audible reaction to him making the pencil disappear. And I like looked around and was like, this is the first time I have ever experienced like people like besides like comedies, because it's common to laugh out loud, but like actually gasp and be like, Oh my. And just like somebody said a few choice words, but (laughs) Um, yeah, and so like 
this movie brought like everyone to a certain reaction and emotion. And then like afterwards, people were standing outside the movie theater on Main Street talking about like, oh my goodness, did you know this character was this? And did you catch this Easter egg? And oh, I can't wait till they make the next one. And oh, it's too bad that Heath Ledger died. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, all those conversations happened like for thirty minutes to an hour after the movie, and people are just standing out on Main Street. Do the, you know that those were the best movies you saw when you didn't even leave the theater? You just stood outside and talked about it with other with your friends. And some people I didn't even know, yeah. but they were like, "We just shared something. Let's let's have a convo." Well, and I think that's what Marty Scorsese doesn't understand when he's bashing comic book movies because it's funny that comic book movies have provided a lot of those experiences. You talk about the Dark Knight. Obviously, Avengers Endgame is one that people had visceral experiences in the theater. Oh, yeah. Of emotion, like, that, that, you know, that was loud and audible, and you shared it with other people. And it was another one of those movies you talked about it outside afterwards. You're like, oh, that was incredible. And not even then, if we'd have had... The technology we had back in when the Dark Knight came out, you probably have clips of it shared on YouTube of the crowd reactions. Crowd reactions and would have had some spoilers and <laughs> I would have been mad. <laughs> Except I would have seen it and so it would have been okay. Yeah. But. Um, another, uh, I remember a lot of the movies I went with friends. Uh, one movie I went with friends, uh, it wasn't a big movie. And it wasn't in a big theater. It was actually in Liberty Hall in Lawrence, Kansas, that shows showed indie movies. They didn't show the big budget, big movies from the big studios. Um, they showed the little ones, and it was a little theater. And I remember I went to a movie I'd never heard of and I didn't really know much about with my friends. In fact, none of us really knew a whole lot about it other than we had enjoyed the people that made uh, the movies, some of their previous movies, in particular Fargo by the Coen brothers. And mm. so this movie we went to was a movie called The Big Lebowski. And we went and saw that movie with no expectations, not not really knowing what we were getting into. And it was one of those moments in my circle of friends' life, like, look, yeah, and you can say a lot of things because, like, listen, uh, as far as, you know, Christians go or whatever, there's a ton of curse words. In this movie, it's, I wouldn't recommend it to people with kids or anything like that, but... Um, we, my friends, my circle of friends will still, to this day, if you're around them, quote this movie. You're out of your element. We just would, and, and we rewatched it and we rewatched it and rewatched it. It was just one of those movies that uh, was, was a big moment for us. Not only because we enjoyed the movie, which fine, a lot of people enjoy The Big Lebowski, but it was more than that. It was more about sharing that experience with friends. And I found, especially a couple times over the years, that when you didn't know what to expect from a movie, you had no expectations, that some of, some of those were the most enjoyable. I, I went and saw Basketball once with my friends, which was an, an utterly stupid movie. What? Yeah, but we saw it at the Dollar Theater, so we paid like a dollar to get in. We just did it on a whim because we were bored. And, and we went and saw basketball and just had a great time because we had no expectations. It didn't have to wow us with its comedy prowess. But it did. It was just an enjoyable experience, and a lot of them are with friends. And I think that's mm. a great thing about the movie theater. Okay, so for my second story, I shift okay. to something more wholesome, but picture it. June... 14th ish, probably 15th, um, 2013. Mm. I'm like 10 years younger. You, and, you look 10 years younger. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. Good for you. And I am like going out in public on one of my first early dates with oh. a lady. By the name of Leah. Oh, it's a lady. And our first movie together is one of Scotty's favorites, Man of Steel. Wow. You remember the first movie you went to your uh, wife with? So the reason it's memorable is early on, like when they're doing like the intro credits and like Man of Steel pops up. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I lean over to Leah and say, this is loosely based on my real life story. <laughs> it's one of the first times I ever used this line, and it definitely would not be the last. That was when you won her. It that really was. really was the moment. That was the moment where she was like, I'm going to marry this man. Yes. So <laughs> if you watch Man of Steel, just know. What a lie. <laughs> what a you are a legend, sir. Yes. Legend. Uh, is it bad that I don't remember the first movie I went to with to, with Danielle? I don't know if movies were a big thing for you and Danielle. That was for Leah and I, because I can tell you the first movie we watched together, and it's a weird one, but it wasn't in theaters. It was Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Because <laughs> she's like, have you heard of this? And I'm like... Nope. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I loved this as a kid. Yeah. How did you not hear about it, You're, you know, being an 80s kid? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where was I? But, yeah, we watched that, so. That's incredible. Yeah, I can remember our my Danielle and I's first date, but we didn't go see a movie. We just went and had dinner. I think I took her... I want to say it was on the border because hey, I'm classy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say Olive Garden. <laughs> no, no, it was Mexican. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was like we spent a, a couple hours there, I think. And I was late our, on our first date. I was late oh. about an hour because she lived in Kansas City. And so I'm going down I-35 and there was just a huge, there was an accident or something. And I got stuck on I-35 for like an hour. And this was back before like cell phones were just starting to become a thing. And I didn't have one because I was being a countercultural. Yeah. And you I would not have had all the anytime minutes back then either. <laughs> I refused to get one. And she thought something had happened to me. She thought terrible things like, oh, he probably died in an accident or something. But I eventually got there. And the rest is history, right? But we didn't go see a movie on our first date. Mm. What, what I remember about our early marriage, when we were married, this is some of our sweetest memories, is back before we had kids, you know, there weren't, you don't have activities. You, your weekends are free, you know, like, and so how did we fill those times? Well, this was back when Netflix was still a DVD hawking service. And we we got uh, the DVDs of 24 because we hadn't watched it when 24 first started. So we, they were like four or five seasons deep into 24. So we just started renting the the DVDs. They'd send them in the pouches and we'd roll through because we had the deal where you could get three at a time. Yes. And we'd roll through season that was, took care of about one season. Right. And we'd roll through the first season and we were like, like in 48 hours. <laughs> and we'd be sitting there on Sunday going, man, I wish we had, I wish we had season two. <laughs> um, sad news. My dad is just now watching 24. Really? Is like, he enjoying it? Yes, loving it. Yeah, I'm sure he is, man. <laughs> Who wouldn't love Jack Bauer? I just got my parents to switch to streaming stuff. Oh, nice. nice <laughs> so, yeah. yes, I'm doing the Lord's work. Yep, my wife and I still quote 24 as jokes to each other. Um, you know, like sometimes it's not, it's not always appropriate because there was some, they use a lot of the D word, like, Darn it, Chloe! We're running out of time. <laughs> like he's always running out of time. Oh uh, man, but those were good times. That's what I remember about that. That's not really a movie theater experience. No. <laughs> um, possibly one of the. I I actually say this to my non-Christian friends. <laughs> I actually <laughs> say this is the most amazing movie theater experience I've ever been a part of. It was a midnight showing, a midnight premiere. Eek! When they used to do that, and it was for a movie called. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed to even say it, but South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. Um, I would not be embarrassed to say it, but I did <laughs> not watch it. So, Oh, it's so vulgar. It's so vulgar, but you got to remember, I wasn't a Christian at this time. I wasn't married. Uh, I had no shame. And this movie, if people, if you remember, it was a musical. Yes. That was part of the kind of the, the charm of it is... They surprised a lot of people by kind of poking fun at Disney cartoons. As they should. And so it was a musical, and one of the songs, so first of all, the crowd was absolutely raucous. I mean, it was a college town. It's midnight for a premiere of South Park, which is sort of a sophomoric boy kind of thing anyways. It is. And one of the songs they did was actually a song that they recycled 
that was actually first premiered on the show that was on Comedy Central. And Cody, when they started singing the song, and I'm not going to tell you what the name of the song was. If you know, you know. Because I can't. I just can't say it. Because, again, I'd be embarrassed that I'm now a pastor. But the entire theater just started belting out this song along with the movie. And everyone, like, full-throated is just singing along with this song. And I remember just, like, kind of soaking it in. And I was like, oh, this is what all those weird people who love the Rocky uh, horror picture show are all about, right? This is what they <laughs> talk about when they say that that's so much fun. And it was really like this inner, it was the first time I'd ever been in a movie theater like that where it was like completely interactive. Um, unless you guys were doing the time warp, I don't think that it's the yeah. same experience. No, but it was, it was completely interactive and spontaneous, you know, cause I know they do like the sing along things now at theaters where they put the words on the screen, but that wasn't like this. This was just fans people who were fans of the show and they were just enjoying it together. And it, it, to this day, I remember it as being just one of the, the most fun experiences I ever had in a theater. Although I don't like to talk about it a lot because you know, South park embarrassing. <laughs> Do you have another one? Okay. So I have this one and I have one more after it. Okay. But this one's quick. Yeah. So, hit me with both of them. Um, the, the first one is the dark night rises. So, I'm, I had watched the midnight premiere with another group of friends. It was good. Then I go with my friend Jackson, fellow geek at the round table, and mm -hmm. another friend. We go up to Olathe so we can see it on the big, big screen. Because, mm -hmm. again, Christopher Nolan, you got to see it on the big screen. And who just happens to be there? The KU basketball team. Yeah. Those are always fun. That had happened. So I lived in Lawrence, and that would happen occasionally. And, like, Jeff Withy and Ben McLemore were there. If you're not a KU fan, you have no idea who we're talking about. Right and now. I was a huge KU fan, so <laughs> it was exciting. But Jackson will tell you that, like, we walked out of the theater before I got to say, Hi, Jeff. <laughs> what? Oh, no. <laughs> and so it is... The misconnection of meeting Jeff Withy. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the sentimental, heartfelt one. Yeah, hit me with the sentimental, heartfelt one. Okay, so picture it 2011, 2012 um, ish, uh, Christmas time, and I'm in Oklahoma City at like their brickyard area. Okay, yeah. The fancy area. Um, their minor league baseball team has a, a stadium, and like you can go sledding. There during, lovely, lovely downtown. It is. Yeah. But they also have the biggest uh, theater screen in Oklahoma. Oh. And so my first youth group that I had, and so the youth director, like, planned this huge trip because he's originally from that area. He's like, this is going to be awesome. We go, we take the youth group. And, like, everyone was making fun of the movie before we started watching it. We watch it, and afterwards, everyone's like, that was really funny. It just happened to be The Muppets. Oh, yeah. So that movie's special to me because that's, like, the first movie that I guess I took a youth group to. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, like spirit filled yeah. movie no but no but good it's a good movie yeah and so my kids love the muppets um and i now know that song just because <laughs> i i probably would not have watched it by myself because right. i was a single man back then yeah. and but yeah now i can look back and say the muppets it's a good experience memories uh my last ones have to do with like the series of movies, right? Um, the ones you went to and you were going on opening night. I remember the Lord, remember the Lord of the Rings movies came out back to back to back, right? Uh, they came out almost annually. Am I remembering that right? Always around Christmas. I feel like you're telling the truth in that time of year. And we went on opening night each night. And I remember that was Lord of the Rings were my favorite books. And I'll never forget. I cried. Like I openly wept at the end of the two towers when Gandalf returns and the, with the reinforcements and they run down that hill because I remember seeing it and it was exactly the way I envisioned it when I read the book. And there was like this emotional moment attached to that for me of what, what movies can be where 
they can be the fulfillment of your imagination for stuff that already existed in your imagination. Slash, I don't know how Pete Jackson did it. Like, because you're right. It's around Christmas time from like the year 2001, 2002, 2003. Yeah, we don't talk enough about what he did with those original, that Lord of the Rings trilogy and just what a monumental undertaking and how good he did with it. Like, cause you can like, look, we can sit here and pick it apart and have little problems with it. If you were fans of the book, Oh, I wish he'd have done this, but really what he did was sort of amazing. Um, especially considering that you have the matrix part two and three that come out back to back that they filmed it back to back. Yeah. Those, and those str- was trash. Straight garbage water. Straight dumpster fires. Yeah. Uh, but th- that's not the series I want to talk about because this series, I think, has a special place in most geek hearts. And that is Star Wars. Oh, I thought you were going to say The Hunger Games. Nope, nope. For, for people my age, it was Star Wars. And, you know, we had, thanks to VCRs, thanks to videotapes. Uh, so I didn't get to see Star Wars and Empire. Obviously, those were, I was too young mm-hmm. for movie theater experiences for those. But Return of the Jedi, I mentioned, was the very first movie I got to see in a movie theater. And then, of course, hundreds of watchings on VHS, on tape, of those movies. And then they came out with the special editions. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. So the special editions, when Lucas went back and redid some things in it and tidied up the special effects a little bit and uh, inserted a couple new scenes here and there. And those came out um, yearly, like the Lord of the Rings trilogy, they came out once a year and i remember those were events that kind of led up to the prequels now the prequels uh there's nothing like the build-up for those in my lifetime i mean even the lord of the rings movies where people were excited it was nothing like the prequels people were camping out for those it was ridiculous yeah so i showed up the for the phantom menace I went, we got tickets at the, at an old movie theater in Kansas City that I don't even think it's there anymore, but it was just like it was one of those grand old theaters that you could fit a thousand people in and a huge screen. And we, we, we got there like six hours early and just were sat in line. The TV, the news was there, you know, they were interviewing people. It was, I mean, it was, it's hard to put for people that weren't around for this, it's hard to really explain how big of a deal this was. Um, I will tell you what my parents said. Because my mom, she's very practical, and she's like, what are these losers (laughs) doing? Do they not have jobs? (laughs) Mom, people can take PTO. (laughs) Call in sick. It was a blur. Like, I don't even remember. I I think I saw all the prequels, all three of them, at least three or four times a piece in the theater, when it was in the theater. That is why George Lucas was able to make... Some serious cheddar and yeah. then sell it and make sequels. And like, look, I can sit here. I had problems with the movies when I got out of the theater, too, with each one of them. But you know what? The charm of those movies, as I look back on them now, I know we like to complain about the prequels, but I I don't anymore because. Because the sequels came out and gave you perspective. <laughs> in part, yeah, because there was a charm to Star Wars that I think the first sequel movie had. I think it captured it in a, in a smaller way. Uh, but then the second movie, while I think it's a good movie, I don't think it's a bad movie like a lot of people do. I think it's the best out of the whole tr- trilogy. I do in. think it was missing some of that Star Wars fantasy and charm that the originals and the prequels had. And I think it's something that Ahsoka briefly has recaptured uh, the TV show and for the first time in a long time, even though it was highly imperfect, like uh, directing storytelling, it had, it had issues everywhere, but there was something about that, the charm of the prequels and the fantasy aspect of it. And just the event status of it that I'll never forget going to see those prequel movies and how excited we were and the build up to them. That was really when the internet. So when the Phantom Menace first comes out, man, that's really when the internet scooping thing hits a peak, it's early peak. Because everybody was trying to figure out what those movies were going to be about. Everybody was trying to figure out the secrets. And, oh, I think Boba Fett's going to be in it. <laughs> Why? We all thought Boba Fett was going to be in all of them. And no. He was He was a kid in one. But, uh, yeah. Anyways, those are, those are our big movie theater memories. I hope you enjoyed that. And maybe you can share some of your movie theater memories with us. 
uh, when we put this on social media and you know, I've been thinking, would it would it serve people well if we did chats? Would would anyone be interested in chats on the Pop Culture Pastor community group? Because you know you can do chats, but then it goes to Messenger. I don't know if anybody would like that or if that would just be intrusive. I feel that's intrusive to me. Okay, maybe no chats. Though. I don't know. <laughs> this is all new. Uh, I hope you're subscribed. If not, subscribe to the show. Download things so you can listen to us on the run, on the road. Uh, give us a rating. Uh, if you haven't done that before, that helps us as well. And thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Adios. Pop culture pastor.